Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, it's the WA Today public holiday today, Monday, June the 6th. Uh, my name's Tim Guest uh, and uh, we're here live on Facebook. Um, so uh, I don't know if you've got a little bit of background noise. We've got uh, Elizabeth Key out over there and I know they've got some celebrations going on today. I can hear the bands playing so um, everyone's having a good time and enjoying uh, their public holiday. Uh, look, I only, I only really decided earlier today to actually do this, uh, to do this video today. Um, I've just got a number of questions over the last few days. Uh, people coming to me and, and have, wanting to get my views and my conversations about, you know, what's happening with housing affordability in Australia. Um, obviously, it's uh, we got the uh, election campaign that's happening at the moment. Um, I actually saw a, a news article the other day that said that it's one of the uh, the top three. Uh, election issues at the moment and uh, in fact what the people think is that both leaders are currently really failing to address housing affordability as an issue so you know I wanted to discuss this housing affordability issue and talk about exactly what's happening now before I really get into that I also want to talk a little bit about why it is that we do these broadcasts um, essentially a lot of people the reason why they come to me is there's so much misinformation out there in the industry uh, when it comes to um, you know what really is the facts and what really is the fiction out there you get a lot of commentators out there you get a lot of media out there obviously with their vested interests owned by you know it's the wealthy people that own the media right so uh, they only really want to tell you what they want you to hear um, and then of course there's all those people out there that are trying to relieve you of your money so it can be really hard for people to figure out exactly you know who to listen to what to believe and we have these broadcasts so people can really determine what fact uh, is from the fiction and it also gives people an opportunity to to get their questions answered as well you know particularly when it comes to things like property investment wealth building whether it's investment in other forms of assets how to re increase their in uh, sorry reduce their personal debt uh, and uh, also a lot of people are very keen to learn how to reduce their tax as well so let's get on to the subject of the day housing affordability Look, the simple reality is this, if we actually talk about some of the facts, and I've got some notes in front of me here because, you know, I don't want to just give you my my opinions. I actually want to back these up with the research that, um, that uh, or where I find my research from, that we can determine the actual facts rather than just uh, the opinions. The reality is right now, and you wouldn't know this from reading the mainstream media, but housing affordability in Australia is very strong right now. Uh, just last week, the Housing uh, Industry Association published their Housing Affordability Index, which is something that they release every three months. What it found was this, if we look nationally, currently housing affordability is the best that it's been in the last five years. And if you take Sydney out of that and look at some of the other areas in Australia, we actually currently have the best housing affordability that we've had since 2003. So we're talking 13 years since we've had conditions which will allow us to have the best possible housing affordability. So it, today, today, right now, if, if you know, you're looking at buying your own home or you are looking at investing in property, now is a great time to do it. Um, look. Sydney obviously is very expensive, but we've also got to remember that there's 20 million people in Australia that leave elsewhere than Sydney. Now, what also backs up some of these, these figures when it comes to the Housing Affordability Index? The other thing that we've got to look at is the behaviours of particularly first home buyers. What, what are we seeing in that first home buyer end of the market? First and foremost, I don't know if you can hear my dogs now actually growling at me, uh, sitting over there growling at me doing this broadcast, so he might want to have a, a bit of a say uh, in, uh, in the broadcast as well. But if, if we look at the actual figures, the actual stats about how first home buyers and how the young are operating in terms of their purchases. First and foremost, a third of all new home sales are first home buyers. So we're talking nationally, and then if we look, if we look at had a bit of a uh, I don't know black spot. Good old Telstra. I wonder if the network's gone down again. Um, if we look at um, if we look at existing dwellings, then currently what we're seeing is 27% of all sales to ex of existing homes are to first time. Uh, first timers, first home buyers. So you can see that this housing affordability is actually being reflected in the current buying behaviour of first time buyers. Now. How does this compare to baby boomers? One of the things that I, I hear a lot about is that baby boomers had it way easier than people have it today. You know, there was uh, there was actually an article in uh, on news.com.au last week that, that started to discuss about how, look, baby boomers didn't have it as, as good as what you think they might be. Now, there are some different conditions. So first and foremost, what are the things that we're considering when we can take into consideration what baby boomers were having to deal with? 
Well, you got to remember in the late 80s that interest rates rose to 17%. So a lot of a lot of baby boomers that, that in that time with a mortgage would have been paying, you know, typically you pay roughly about 2% higher than what the uh, the current cash rate is right now. So you're probably talking upwards of around about 19% on their interest rates for a home loan. Whereas on the flip side today, it's quite easy for people to get in, you know, maybe just under the 4% mark, obviously with promotions and things like that that are available. We currently have uh, some of the, the cheapest home loan rates on record. So there, there's, you've got that flip side, okay? Now, well, fair enough, that's fine. Good team, we've got cheaper interest rates, but look, house prices weren't anywhere near as expensive as what they were today. But look, we've got to bring that back relative to what people's incomes were. If we look at the interest rates the baby boomers were paying in the late 80s as compared to what a current first home buyer is paying right now, the difference is this. Back then, a mortgage payment would have taken up 45% of an average income earner's uh, income. That's almost half of what they were getting paid, their net income, almost half of what they were getting paid was going towards their mortgage. Whereas if we look at the figures today, currently it's only 31% for, for an average income earner. So once again, you know, we can kind of see that this, this common uh, story get, that gets thrown about, the way that people are ramping up and talking about housing affordability being such a major issue. Uh, you know, if we start to really look at some of the facts and figures, we can start to see that maybe this is not exactly how it's being portrayed. Now, indeed, in some respects, young adults today do have it more difficult, or they, they, there's different things to consider, and there are some aspects of it which are harder for people today. So. Today, one of the biggest things that people are having to deal with is the stamp duties. I know there are some incentives in some of the states when it comes to stamp duties or discounts that are available, but also the deposits because the house prices are. So really the flip side is this. It can be much harder for Gen Ys to actually get in on the property level. But if we look back at the baby boomers, they were under way greater pressure when it came to the actual interest rates they were paying and the mortgage stress because the amount of money coming out of their own pocket. So like I said, just really wanted to start to bring um, some facts, some reality to this whole housing affordability debate. The other thing that I start to, you know, one of the other things that really throws me when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to the housing affordability to, uh, debate is there's this statement that I see all the time, and it's something that I have never actually. Uh, seen any real hard research about and, and that is people are always saying that we have the most expensive real estate in Australia Well, great comment. I hope they got the facts to back it up because I've spent hours and hours and hours searching the internet uh, sp You know speaking to the different uh, industry advocacy bodies to find out if they've got any stats or data or um, to facts to actually back this up There's only one piece of of research that I've been able to find myself. And that was a Knight Frank study that was done uh, a little while back now, I think it was about 18 months ago. And what it found was, um, and I thought it was actually qu quite a good um, quite a good study because what it actually compared was not just median house price. See, the thing you've got to remember is this, we may, we often throw this, this figure about median house price, median house price over the last quarter, over the last month, over the last 12 months, we've seen a rise, a fall, about, with the median house price. But my question to you is this, what is a median house? Okay, now, one of the things that we've seen uh, over the last 30 years is we've seen a dramatic decrease in the size of a lot. You know, I personally, you know, I grew up in the, you know, late 80s, you know, maybe early 90s. I was living in Gosnells, as many of you know. I grew up on a quarter acre block. That's a thousand square meters. You know, I now see, Quite regularly, if, if people are lucky, they may be able to get a 350, 400 square meter lot, and people consider nowadays that's a pretty good sized lot. The other thing we've got to consider is the size of the homes. The average size of a home, I don't have the actual stats. There was something that I saw about two years ago. I, I haven't been able to locate it or not, wasn't able to locate it in time for this broadcast. But the average square meterage from a, for a home that's being built in Australia at the moment is over 200 square meters. 200 square meters. That's almost twice the average size of homes in other developed countries in, a, uh, in the world. Okay, so one of the things we've got to consider alongside the size is not only uh, alongside the price is obviously what it's buying what's the size that it's buying now this night frank survey that i was talking about it stated that in sydney so we're talking the center capital city currently with a median house price of over a million dollars um it was the seventh 
ranked as compared to you know places like Shanghai, London, New York, many other major cities that uh, you know we're, uh, obviously around the world. So you know this this argument that people throw out all the time about um, you know Australia having some of the the highest house prices in the world. Uh, look, personally, I think it's complete and utter rubbish. Um, and look, one of the one of the reasons that it's a real problem for me is that it's. Well, the, the reason why people often bring it up or, you know, it's particularly been brought up a lot to do with the negative gearing debate that we've seen. And I, I, I see time after time, you know, people talking about investors, people in talking about the wealthy, uh, taking advantage of this tax break that enables, you know, investors to get in there and defeat, you know, first home eyes and the average, uh, you know, every hardworking Australian try uh, who are trying to uh, get in there and buy those houses and investing and investors are really pushing the um, the price of negative gearing up now I'm not going to uh, go into the negative gearing debate too much today um, I don't know if we've got enough time a couple of things I'm going to touch on about the negative gearing debate um, just really to have people have their attention on particularly what they're hearing when they're listening to the two or the, the three major parties talking about uh, negative gearing and, and tax reform so first and foremost, negative gearing, well one of the things to clear up is this, we always hear people talk about like a negatively geared house. Tr truth is this, there is no such thing as a negatively geared house, okay? The only thing that can be neg negatively geared is a person, okay? As a person is someone who generates an income and a person is someone who pays tax. So you've really got to keep that in mind, okay? We don't, you, this, it's just inaccurate to talk about a negatively geared house, alright? So now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about the policies itself. So they also talk about this as a tax break. Now, I don't really think that this is a tax break. Um, you know, of course, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but let's just consider it from a couple of points of view. Well, first and foremost, why is it that these that, that Labor, are, or even Liberal for that fact, are talking about negative gearing as, as tax reform? You know, are they talking about it from a housing affordability point of view, or are they talking about it from a tax revenue point of view. Um, I certainly understand, you know, currently with the, uh, the, the the budget deficit that we're in, you know, one of the things that we've got to look at doing is cutting our spending, uh, boosting the coffers uh, to help us build a strong economy. Um, but really, if we look at negative gearing, 80% of people that negative, sorry, the figure's incorrect, let me, let me correct it, right? Two thirds of Australians that negatively gear have a taxable income of under $80,000, okay? So two thirds. This is not something that really is going to. I mean, obviously, the tax, the, the rich are always going to take advantage of every possible tax uh, legislation that they can to minimise their tax. If you've ever seen the video from Kerry Packer, you'd be an absolute fool to not use every rule and regulation to reduce your tax. That's something, obviously, that we advocate and we're talking about to our clients all the time. So, look, of course, there are going to be some benefit for the wealthy, but this is going to have the biggest impact. Look, if, if a rich person, you know, gets a ten thousand dollar, you know, tax rebate from the government at the end of the year, does that make a big difference to them? Not, not really. But if we're talking about police, if we're talking about nurses, if we're talking about traders, if we're talking about everyday hardworking Australians just like you, if you're not going to be able to negatively gear a property, that is going to have a big big, big impact on your individual financial circumstance. And the reality is this, the majority of people that negatively gear are earning $80,000 or under. So this is something that is going to hurt Labor's own voters more than anything else. A couple other stats about property investing as well, just to give you really an idea about how far reaching this is, 73% of property investors only invest in one property. So 73, two, three quarters of people that are investing in property only have one. You can hardly really refer to that as being the rich and the wealthy taking advantage of this negative gearing uh, um, policy. Not only, uh, so like I said, I think this is gonna impact everyday Australians more than anything else. The other thing for me is this, how else are we gonna get ahead, okay? Everyday Australians, Pretty much you've got two options if you're gonna get ahead financially in life. You can either go and start a business. Well, what are the facts and figures that come up to, that come to new businesses getting started? Well, the first figure is this. 50% of new businesses that are registered within the first three years are deregistered. Another way of saying it is that 50% of businesses in the first three years have failed. 
that is a highly risky strategy. You might as well go down to the uh, the Crown Casino, you know, put your money on red or black, 50%, right? Flip a coin. That's basically the same chances of getting ahead using a business or, you know, being becoming entrepreneurial. Now, of course, there's certain people in life that that's gonna suit. Certain in people in life that they can really go for that. You know, they, uh, they, they back themselves, they trust themselves, maybe they've got some autonomy in their life financially that they can afford to take that risk. But for the everyday hardworking Australian that's getting out there, working their guts out every single week, what option have they got of getting ahead? What, superannuation? We already know that superannuation is not working. You know, I mean, the stats around superannuation, 25% of Australians do not have, a, working Australians, that is, do not have a single cent of superannuation. And the last time the figures were taken on superannuation, 2013, the average superannuation balance for an Australian is 170 grand. Yet the government tell me, or tell us, that you're gonna need a million, million dollars in super to be able to re retire comfortably. So, look, superannuation ain't working. Business, much higher. Um, uh, much higher risk uh, way to go. I think um, going after negative gearing is um, is really attacking the everyday Australians, one of their only few opportunities to try and get ahead financially. Um, tax revenue, you want more tax revenue, how about you focus on the, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of multinational companies out there that are, you know, I mean, you, technically they're minimising tax, but let's just tell the truth, right? They are basically ripping Australia off. They're avoiding paying tax. Um, most of those companies pay somewhere in the realm of 1% tax uh, as compared to, you know, the average average Australian, which is paying, you know, basically anywhere from around about 20% tax once you average it out across their uh, their income tax bracket. So I think that um, that uh, property investors are very unfairly being attacked when, for when it comes to housing affordability. The other thing, just to throw it in there, last week I was in Europe. I was uh, travelling through Italy and through France. I uh, had the, the privilege of attending the, uh, the Monaco Grand Prix. Um, uh, here's one of the things that I found when I was walking and talking through those major cities in Europe. Not a single person in those major cities owns their own home. They understand that if they want to be living in the major cities, then they have to rent. Okay, it's just a stark reality, and unfortunately, the simple stark reality that some Australians are just going to have to face themselves. You want to be able to own your own home, you've got to target what you can afford. And if that means moving out of the, the capital cities, if that means moving to regional areas, then that's something that you're going to have to consider. Um, you know, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about today. I've probably got a little bit carried away and excited about the de debate on negative gearing. There's a lot more uh, I probably want to talk about when it comes to that debate. I've, I've been contacted and spoken to both Liberal and Lab Labor candidates uh, when it comes to this particular um, this particular issue. I think it's an important issue that, um, that needs to be dealt with. Um, and, you know, in reality, if you're actually going to start taxing uh, people for investing in property. I mean, look, here's the flip side. Anyone out there that's self-employed just like I am, I have my own business, I spend money on my own business, I get to take that off the income before I calculate my tax. But what, we're gonna say that, that, that uh, uh, an investor can't do that? We're gonna say that, that if they go and forward their future, spend money on building their wealth, spend money so that they don't have to rely on a pension, don't have to rely on superannuation, we're not gonna allow them to take that off their, their revenue before we calculate the tax? Just simply just doesn't make sense. So look guys, that's pretty much um, all I've got uh, from me today. A Couple of things that I wanna um, remind you about today. First and foremost, make sure you like the video, make sure you share this on the timeline so that your friends and family can see it. Um, also make sure, if you're not already someone who likes the Infinite Wealth Facebook page, you know, please get on there, uh, click like on our Facebook page. We'd love to see uh, more people become part of our community. And the other thing that you can do is you can uh, subscribe um, to these live broadcasts. If you look in the uh, up in the top right corner of, uh, of this video, there's a little downward arrow. Click the arrow and you can turn on notifications so that next time I do a live bro broadcast, you get notified about it. You get a chance to see me live and in the flesh and uh, and uh, I really um, you know look forward to it. Not only that, I plan to um, update you guys more and more about what's happening. Um, I plan on doing basically weekly, uh, keeping you guys up to date week to week about everything that's happened um, or happening that week when it comes to investing, when it comes to debt, and when it comes to uh, tax. And uh, and then I'm also probably gonna do the odd random uh, um, video here and there. Uh, maybe give you a bit of behind the scenes look at Infinite Wealth or show you some of the products that we have um, or even keep you up to date with some of the stuff that I'm doing when I'm traveling or um, uh, just generally hanging about and uh, enjoying the, love, the life that I, uh, I love, to, uh, love to live. 
Um, guys on Twitter, you want to ask me a question, use the hashtag, hashtag AskTimGuest. Um, we'll keep tracking that throughout the week. Keep a list of your questions uh, and make sure we get them answered for your next live broadcast. So thanks a lot for spending time with me now. It's been great talking to you. Enjoy uh, if you're in Western Australia the rest of your long weekend tonight. Uh, of course, if uh, you're on the East Coast, uh, you guys got a long weekend next weekend. Uh, and uh, and we'll see you uh, see you next week. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great night. Good night.